Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Nestled within the dense woodlands of New Jersey's Pine Barrens, a chilling legend has persisted for nearly three centuries. The Jersey Devil, a terrifying creature with enormous leathery wings, a horse's head, glowing red eyes, and sharp claws is said to roam this vast wilderness, striking fear into the hearts of locals and visitors alike. But what truth lies behind the myth? One origin tale begins in 1735 with the cursed birth of a child, a thirteenth child, which transformed into a monstrous creature fleeing into the night. As with many folk tales, the story's origins are shrouded in mystery, from witchcraft and demonic encounters to star-crossed lovers and indigenous deities, the Jersey Devil's origins and evolution has been reimagined countless times, each version adding a new layer to its mystique. Through centuries of sightings, media frenzies, and even hoaxes, the Jersey Devil has evolved from a local superstition to a beloved state symbol to a nationally known cryptid. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… In the mid-1970s, a terrifying predator stalked the streets of Oakland County, Michigan, abducting and murdering four innocent children. For nearly half a century, the identity of the Oakland County child killer has eluded investigators, leaving a trail of anguish, conspiracy theories, and unanswered questions in its wake. It's a cold case that continues to haunt the community, as justice never came. The Sabretooth Clan, a group of modern-day vampires who blend seamlessly into society by day but embrace their nocturnal alter egos by night. With custom fangs, vintage attire, and a unique philosophy, these lifestylers host extravagant balls, perform rituals, and even have their own spiritual pantheon, all while maintaining a strict no-blood-drinking policy. What is it like to live as a vampire? In 1864, Canton, Ohio, a romance between German immigrant Ferdinand Hoffman and local girl Caroline Yost spiraled into a tale of deception, abuse, and ultimate tragedy. Their ill-fated union, marred by Hoffman's criminal past and violent tendencies, culminated in a shocking church stabbing and a dramatic manhunt. From fiery pits to Satan's domain, our modern conception of hell is a tapestry woven from centuries of art, literature, and religious interpretation. But how much of what we believe about the underworld actually aligns with biblical teachings? We'll look at some common misconceptions about hell and discover how our cultural understanding of eternal damnation often diverges from scriptural truths. But first, deep in the heart of New Jersey's Pine Barrens lurks a legend that has haunted the Garden State for nearly three centuries. The Jersey Devil, a creature of nightmares with leathery wings and glowing red eyes, was born from a curse in the 1700s and has endured ever since with sightings still taking place. We begin with that story. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. 
You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. New Jersey is a highly sought-after residential area situated between New York City and Philadelphia. This state boasts the highest population density in the entire Union, with over 1,200 individuals per square mile. Alaska, in contrast, is a mere one person per square mile. Despite New Jersey's reputation for suburban expansion, a hidden jewel lies within – the Pine Barrens. Also referred to as the Pinelands, this vast expanse of land encompasses approximately 1.1 million acres, which equates to 22 percent of New Jersey's total land area. The Pine Barrens feature sandy soil, dense woodlands, and untouched waterways, creating a pristine environment. However, amidst this wilderness lies a chilling legend – the Jersey Devil. Roaming the Barrens is a creature described as having enormous leathery wings a horse's head, glowing red eyes and sharp claws, causing fear among locals for almost three centuries. Legend has it that the Jersey Devil came into existence on a dark and stormy night in 1735, born to a woman named Mother Leeds. Residing in Leeds Point, a coastal community in southeastern New Jersey, she was in the throes of a difficult and prolonged labor while pregnant for the thirteenth time. In excruciating pain, she uttered, let this one be a devil. A seemingly healthy child was born, but shortly after delivery, the infant developed a tail and wings. Emitting a piercing scream, it flew up the chimney and vanished into the night. Garden State folklore contains various accounts of the devil's origins. One version suggests that Mother Leeds, portrayed as a witch, engaged in relations with the devil. Another tale describes the monster as the offspring of a cursed relationship between a Jersey girl and a British soldier during the Revolutionary War. The indigenous Lenape people of southern New Jersey revered a forest deity named Missing, depicted as a deer-like creature with bat-like wings. It is plausible that European settlers in the area assimilated this woodland deity into their legends of the so-called Leeds Devil. These narratives have presented historians with an intriguing enigma – the true genesis of the Jersey Devil. Professors Brian Regal and Frank Esposito from Keene University have linked the legend to a 17th-century English settler named Daniel Leeds. Born in Leeds, England around 1652 to Quaker parents, Leeds embraced the Quaker faith as an adult before immigrating to New Jersey circa 1677. He and his family established themselves in Burlington within a lively Quaker community. Leeds pursued a career as a surveyor and acquired land on New Jersey's southern Atlantic coast in the 1690s, where Leeds Point, the family residence, was established. He ventured into writing and publishing, beginning with an almanac detailing celestial movements and astrological symbols. The publication of the almanac and subsequent works drew the disapproval of the Quaker community, who eventually branded him as evil and Satan's harbinger. Regal and Esposito posit that it was Leeds' tarnished reputation that led to the Leeds' name being associated with monstrous and supernatural entities. The search for historical evidence of Mother Leeds' identity has been fruitless. Daniel Leeds, her husband, was married four times. His first wife, Mary, who bore him several children, passed away in England. After moving to New Jersey, Leeds remarried three more times. Among his wives, Dorothy Young stands out as a potential candidate to be the real Mother Leeds, as she gave birth to eight of his children before her death in 1699. Yet no 17th century sources exist that explicitly refer to Dorothy or any of Leeds' wives as Mother Leeds, suggesting that they are unlikely to be the inspiration behind the legendary cursed mother. 
the origins of the Leeds Devil legend can be traced back to the religious disputes involving Daniel Leeds, which sowed the seeds for the tale. Stories of the creature lingered in the local folklore of the region, shared as ghostly tales or cautionary warnings about lurking dangers in the forests. Throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, the Leeds Devil remained a prominent figure within a strong oral tradition. It was not until the early 19th century that the Jersey Devil captured greater attention. Legend has it that distinguished figures like American war hero Stephen Decatur encountered the Leeds Devil at his foundry in the Pine Barrens, while ex-King of Spain Joseph Bonaparte claimed to have encountered the beast on his estate Point Breeze. Despite efforts by historians, the original source material for these encounters, found in Decatur's and Bonaparte's records, remains elusive. Additionally, a spate of livestock attacks in 1840 were attributed to the creature. The first documented mention of the Leeds Devil can be found in an 1859 article in the Atlantic Monthly, which covered the folklore of the Pine Barrens. The author, while critical of the local community and its folklore, noted instances where little children did be eaten and maids abused by the monstrous entity. Interest in the Jersey Devil surged during the late 19th and early 20th centuries with the emergence of first-hand testimonies about the creatures in newspapers. An article from the 1893 New York Sun featured an Erie Railroad engineer's claim of an encounter with the Jersey Devil attacking his train. In 1905, the Trenton Times reported that the Leeds Devil, born in Bordentown, resembled more of an ape or chimpanzee. During the first week of January 1909, Philadelphia newspapers extensively covered the Jersey Devil, along with rumors of peculiar footprints appearing in the Pine Barrens. Some reports described incidents of streetcars and social clubs being targeted by a red-eyed, winged, kangaroo-like creature. The media frenzy incited public fear, leading to the enforcement of curfews by local authorities and the formation of hunting groups. A Philadelphia trickster asserted to have captured the Jersey Devil, showcasing it at the 9th and Arch Street Dime Museum as an attraction. The curious public swarmed to witness the creature, which turned out to be a kangaroo painted with artificial wings. The deception was soon unveiled, with the New York Times exposing the fraud in late January 1909. Although the hysteria waned, the legend endured. Sightings of the Jersey Devil persisted throughout the 20th century, albeit not as frequently as in 1909. Folklorists continued to explore tales of the Jersey Devil, cementing the creature's presence in New Jersey's folklore, so much so that roller coasters and even a National Hockey League team, the Jersey Devils, pay homage to it. The monster has evolved into a symbol of pride for New Jersey. Today, visitors can tour locations linked to the local legend in the serene yet sometimes ominous Pine Barrens forests. When Weird Darkness Returns In the mid-1970s, a terrifying predator stalked the streets of Oakland County, Michigan, abducting and murdering four innocent children. For nearly half a century, the identity of the Oakland County child killer has eluded investigators, leaving a trail of anguish, conspiracy theories, and unanswered questions in its wake. It's a cold case that continues to haunt the community as justice never came. That story is up next. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com syndicate. 
That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Syndicate. It is widely acknowledged that individuals who target children are among the most abhorrent beings in existence. While it is one matter to apprehend and administer appropriate justice to the offender, even questioning if any punishment can truly suffice, the quandary arises when the perpetrator remains unidentified. This unfortunate scenario pertains to the Oakland County child killer, who continues to elude identification. The tragic sequence of events commenced on February 15, 1976, when 12-year-old Mark Stebbins failed to return home after visiting an American Legion Hall in Ferndale, Michigan. Despite informing his mother of his imminent return at approximately 1.30 p.m., Mark never made it back. Concerned, his mother contacted authorities at 11 p.m. that evening. Mark was a student in seventh grade at Lincoln Junior High School, standing at four foot seven inches tall, weighing just a hundred pounds, with strawberry blonde hair. Extensive search endeavors yielded no results, until a pivotal discovery transpired. Businessman Mark Bodegheimer, while departing work to visit a drugstore within the New Orleans Mall in Southfield, noticed a peculiar sight in the northeast quadrant of the parking lot. Initially resembling a mannequin garbed in a blue jacket and jeans, it turned out to be the lifeless form of Mark Stebbins. Tragically, Mark had been strangled to death, with asphyxiation determined as the cause. His head exhibited lacerations to the left and rear, alongside rope burns on his neck, wrists, and ankles. Moreover, he had been violated with a foreign object. During the course of their investigation, the police interrogated several individuals in the vicinity. One individual informed the authorities that he had taken his dog for a walk around the parking lot earlier that day, approximately at 9.30 a.m. He specified that his dog was on a 20-foot leash and claimed that if there had been a body present during that time, either he or his dog would have noticed it. Bodegheimer encountered him at around 11.45 a.m., leaving a time frame of 2 hours and 15 minutes for a body to have been disposed of. No suspect was apprehended. On December 22, 1976, 12-year-old Jill Robinson had a disagreement with her mother. Given their recent divorce, tensions between Jill and her mother were not uncommon. Following an altercation where her mother asked her to assist in preparing dinner by making biscuits, which Jill refused, her mother instructed her to leave until she was ready to engage with the family. Jill made the impulsive decision to run away, gathering clothes, a blanket, and dressed in blue jeans, a shirt, an orange winter coat paired with a blue knit cap, she departed her residence in Royal Oak. Despite residing with her mother, Jill frequently visited her father. Concerned, her father contacted the authorities around 11.30 p.m. that evening. Described as intelligent but solitary, Jill was not expected to seek refuge with a friend. Subsequently, witnesses reported sighting her at a hobby shop merely four and a half blocks from her home. The following morning, between 6 and 7 a.m., she was seen by additional witnesses at Donut Depot. Her bicycle was later discovered behind a local hobby store. Jill's body was discovered beside I-75 to the north of Big Beaver Road, within sight of the Troy Police Station on December 26. She was fully clothed, lying on her back without any restraints, and was accompanied by her backpack. A ring of dark red encircled her head, revealing that she had been fatally shot. The perpetrator had relocated her remains to the site and then executed her in close proximity with a shotgun. The subsequent autopsy revealed that she had received care for a minimum of three days prior to her passing. Her body had been cleansed and, unlike Mark, displayed no indications of sexual assault. Despite ongoing investigations, the perpetrator remained unidentified. The perpetrator wasted no time in striking again, as on January 2, 1977, 10-year-old Christine Milik was reported missing. Christine adventured to a nearby 7-Eleven store from her residence in Berkeley where she lived with her mother. 
a reserved and introverted fifth-grade student at Patton Gill Elementary School, Christine had few companions. With Christine now making the third missing child within a brief span in Oakland County, anxiety levels began to escalate. Concerned about Christine's whereabouts, her siblings repeatedly inquired, when will she return? In a statement on January 5th, her mother remarked, though people mention the Royal Oak girl, Jill Robinson, I refuse to contemplate that thought. Nineteen days later, Christine's loved ones received closure. A postal worker stumbled upon her lifeless body nestled in a snowdrift at the terminus of a desolate road in Franklin Village. Recounting the harrowing discovery, the mail carrier, Jerry Wozni, recollected, I noticed a hand. It filled me with dread. Christine was found fully clothed, positioned on her back with her knees drawn up. There were no immediate signs of violence. Her body was so frozen that officials had to delay the autopsy until the next day. Post-mortem results revealed she had been smothered to death less than 24 hours before her discovery. Her killer had held her captive for 18 days. A task force consisting of 35 officers representing nine different departments was assembled to locate the perpetrator. The task force was stationed in Southfield, with Police Sergeant Joseph Kreese leading the investigation. As of March 16, 1977, they had yet to apprehend the killer. Timothy King, an 11-year-old boy known for his athleticism and sociable nature, left his residence in Birmingham to walk three blocks to the pharmacy. His aim was to purchase some candy, bringing along his skateboard and football. Regrettably, Timothy never made it back home. During Timothy's disappearance, his parents were dining at a nearby restaurant while his two older brothers were also away. Before heading out herself, Timothy's older sister lent him money for the candy and left the door slightly ajar for his return convenience. Upon returning around 9 p.m., Timothy's parents discovered the door ajar and an empty house. They contacted his friends and conducted a search in the vicinity, but there was no sign of him. Police officers visited the pharmacy to question clerk Amy Walters, who recalled interacting with the boy named Tim. She remembered selling him candy and seeing him exit through a rear door into a dimly lit parking lot around 8.30 p.m. Police Chief Jerry Tobin expressed concern, stating, "...whatever happened to Tim occurred between his departure from the store and his arrival home. The situation does not look favorable at this point." Timothy King went missing on a Wednesday, prompting a massive search effort involving 100 law enforcement officials from Oakland County, as well as volunteers, Oakland County Sheriff's investigators, the county helicopter, and the Special Oakland County Task Force. Timothy's father shared his love for his son, emphasizing Tim's absence from a basketball game on Saturday and a missed practice on Thursday. Describing Tim as an active participant in school activities, his father expressed a strong desire for his safe return. In a troubling revelation, it was disclosed that Timothy had previously mentioned to his mother his intentions of running away from strangers the week before his disappearance. A woman reported witnessing Timothy conversing with a man in the pharmacy parking lot. She provided a detailed description of the man as white, aged between 25 and 35, with dark brown shaggy hair, mutton chops sideburns, a fair complexion, and a husky build. The man drove a late model blue AMC Gremlin with white wall tires and a distinctive white hockey stick stripe along the side. Police came to suspect that he'd been abducted by one or perhaps two individuals who might potentially be linked to other cases involving murdered children in the vicinity. By that time, there were a total of six cases under investigation, two of which were initially considered potentially related, with one ultimately being disproven as connected. Chief Tobin expressed, We believe we're dealing with a sophisticated, intelligent, educated individual, describing the perpetrator as someone whom a child would inherently trust. On March 23, 1977, Timothy King's lifeless body was discovered in a ditch alongside a dirt road in Livonia by a pair of teenagers. He was dressed in the same attire he had worn when he departed home, with his skateboard found nearby, approximately 15 feet from where his body lay. Mirroring the previous incidents, Timothy had been nurtured and cared for. He had been provided his preferred meal, 
Kentucky Fried Chicken. He'd been meticulously groomed and cleaned before meeting his tragic demise through suffocation. Similar to Mark, he had also been subjected to sexual assault. There exists a possibility that Jane Louise Allen could have succumbed to the Oakland County child killer as well. Her remains were recovered from a river in Miamisburg, Ohio, on August 11, 1976. Jean was last spotted hitchhiking along I-75 in Pontiac on August 7. The cause of her death was attributed to carbon monoxide poisoning as she was reportedly confined in the trunk of a vehicle until her passing. On March 16, 1977, the Oakland County Task Force disclosed the following suspect description. Male, age 20-30 above-average education and intelligence, Caucasian, capable of concealing a child for a minimum of 18 days, homosexual, exhibits mental instabilities, obsessively clean, no history of substance abuse, potentially vacationed during December and January, maintains a clean car and residence, resides in a single dwelling with an attached garage, valued at over $30,000. Previous encounters with law enforcement, currently undergoing psychiatric treatment, holds a white-collar job with a 9-to-5 work schedule, operates in southern Oakland County, desires discovery of bodies. A flyer was produced and circulated with the message, The community seeks your assistance. The Oakland County Special Task Force is in search of an individual responsible for multiple child homicides. If you have had contact with this individual, the task force believes they fit the following profile accompanied by key points outlining the offender's profile. Additionally, a composite sketch and description of the individual were provided. Each flyer concluded with an instruction urging individuals with information to contact local law enforcement or call Collect at 313-644-3400, Birmingham Police Department, 151 Martin Street, Birmingham, Michigan, 48011. The task force received over 18,000 leads resulting in approximately two dozen arrests unrelated to the case and the exposure of a multi-state child pornography network operating on North Fox Island in Lake Michigan. Shortly after the murder of Timothy King, a letter was sent to a psychiatrist collaborating with the task force. The correspondence, penned by an individual using the moniker Allen, professed to be a submissive of the perpetrator known as Frank. In the letter, Allen asserted that both he and Frank had served together in the Vietnam War, with Frank allegedly being deeply affected by the act of taking the lives of children. Allen conveyed regret in the letter, expressing concerns about his deteriorating mental state, feelings of endangerment, and suicidal tendencies. He confessed to accompanying Frank in his search for young male victims to slay. Allen instructed the psychiatrist to embed the cryptic phrase, Weather Bureau says trees to bloom in three weeks, in the upcoming Sunday edition of the Detroit Free Press as a signal for their communication. Allen promised to provide photographic proof in exchange for immunity from prosecution. Despite the psychiatrist arranging a meeting with Allen at a bar, Allen failed to appear and subsequently vanished without a trace. In 2005, an unidentified individual using the alias Jeff stepped forward, recalling an acquaintance from 1977. During a 2010 interview with investigators, Jeff recounted anomalous behaviors and conversations with said acquaintance. Notably, the acquaintance referenced specifics detailed in Allen's letter. Jeff provided a formal statement to Oakland County investigators and prosecutor Jessica Cooper, offering evidence in the case. He disclosed his attempts to persuade Cooper to transfer the investigation to the Department of Justice but his suggestions were rebuffed as the department was already engaged through entities like the FBI and the VICAP database. Jeff sought information about the Allen letter to validate his suspicions, but his request was declined as he failed to present new evidence. Cooper described the interview as a rambling statement articulating a theory linking the Oakland County child killer abductions and murders to pagan holidays, the lunar calendar, and Wiccan rituals. Undeterred, Jeff proceeded to communicate with Deborah Jarvis, the mother of Christine Milik, and other investigative journalists. He asserted that he was part of a team of 12 investigators working on the case and claimed he could identify the perpetrator. Despite inquiries about the law enforcement division he collaborated with, 
Jeff chose not to disclose this information. Stating that he had devoted 10,000 hours to the investigation over the years, Jeff hesitated to share his findings due to his skepticism about the competence of the Oakland County investigators. He suggested that interference by Cooper might have occurred. Paul Hughes, the attorney of Deborah Jarvis, believed that Jeff's investigation had identified the murderer. However, he refused to reveal his discoveries unless authorities provided essential information enabling him to confirm the identity of the suspect with certainty. By 2012, Jeff had presented his findings to a restricted group of Detroit journalists via a call on Hughes' cell phone. Insisting that the call remain unrecorded, Jeff asserted that the killers were engaging in Wiccan human sacrifice rituals coinciding with pagan celebrations of the lunar calendar. He claimed there were approximately 11 to 16 victims and pointed out several notable similarities among the cases, dismissing them as improbable coincidences. Hughes initiated litigation against the authorities of Oakland County for $100 million, alleging mishandling of the investigation, and called for Jessica Cooper's resignation. The lawsuit claimed a conspiracy to cover up and hinder the investigation. In March 2012, the case was dismissed due to insufficient evidence. Another individual, Archibald Edward Sloan, a known child molester, was investigated as a suspect. Despite hair samples from his car matching those found on the bodies of Timothy King and Mark Stebbins, they did not belong to Sloan. Forensic DNA analysis in 2012 revealed that the hair found on Sloan's car seat and the victims both matched an unidentified man. This led authorities to suspect that Sloan had lent his car to the perpetrator and may have knowledge of their identity. Sloan took a polygraph test, which he failed. The witness reported that Timothy was abducted by two men, with one resembling John Wayne Gacy, who was coincidentally in Michigan at the time. However, Gacy's DNA did not match that found on the victims. Subsequently, Parma Heights police identified a new suspect, Ted Lamborghini, a retired auto worker linked to a 1970s child pornography ring. On March 27, 2007, investigators declared him as their primary suspect. Lamborghini entered a guilty plea for 15 sex-related charges involving young boys. He declined a plea deal requiring him to undergo a polygraph test regarding the Oakland County murders. While investigators did not view him as the perpetrator, they believed he possessed pertinent details that could aid in resolving the case. Despite being offered a reduced sentence in exchange for the polygraph test, he persistently turned it down. Following this, in October 2007, the family of Mark Stebbins initiated a wrongful death lawsuit against Lamborghini, seeking $25,000. They alleged that in the late 1970s, Lamborghini, who resided in the metro Detroit vicinity, had abducted Mark, detained him in a Royal Oak residence for four days, and suffocated him to death during a sexual assault. To date, there has been no formal connection established between Lamborghini and Mark Stebbins' demise. The investigation stalled until Barry King, Timothy King's father, and his brother Chris King approached law enforcement with a new suspect. They recommended an inquiry into Chris Bush, the offspring of General Motors executive Harold Lee Bush. A key factor linking Bush, the ownership of a blue Vega vehicle resembling the infamous blue gremlin sighted during one of the abductions. Bush had been taken into police custody shortly before Timothy's abduction due to suspicions of involvement in child pornography. Allegedly, Bush took his own life in November 1978 under questionable circumstances. The manner of his death was a gunshot wound directly between the eyes, devoid of gunshot residue and blood spatters. Upon searching the room, four shell casings were discovered, alongside the peculiar finding of his body neatly wrapped under his sheets. Investigating officers came across blood-stained ligatures and a hand-drawn image affixed to the wall depicting a boy resembling Mark Stebbins in a screaming gesture. The shotgun shells recovered were scrutinized in connection to the homicide of Jill Robinson, but no conclusive match was established. Even NASA was consulted to attempt an identification of the caliber, but to no avail, remarked Cooper. No conclusive evidence could link Chris Bush to the aforementioned murders, as the DNA profile did not align and no other incriminating evidence linking him to the crimes was found. 
there exists no definitive evidence to allege Mr. Bush's involvement in the deaths of Timothy King, Jill Robinson, Christine Milik, or Mark Stebbins, stated Paul Watson, the chief assistant Oakland County prosecutor. Subsequently, the state police released 3,400 pages of investigative documents to Barry King. After reviewing these records, the King family produced a documentary titled Decades of Deceit, criticizing law enforcement and prosecutors for their alleged lapses in investigation and lack of cooperation. The documentary argued that authorities overlooked crucial leads unveiled by the family in 2006. Proceeds from the documentary's sales were donated to the Tim King Fund, aimed at aiding abused children and supporting activities for youth in Birmingham. Another lead, James Vincent Gunnels, briefly emerged as a significant suspect. His mitochondrial DNA matched a hair sample found on Christine Milik's body, although Gunnels vehemently denied any involvement. Gunnels stated, I assert my innocence unequivocally. Nevertheless, I am aware of how the state police manipulate words to their advantage. My thoughts are with those families. Their lack of closure is deeply troubling to me. I believe justice has not been served in their cases. After addressing the media, he made personal contact with the King family. Chris King remarked, Initially, I was hesitant to attend. I anticipated the difficulty of being face to face with a possible suspect in this matter. There is a remote chance that he may have played a role in Christine Milik's abduction or death. Although the police disclosed that Gunnels had failed a polygraph test, they were curious to hear his words directly. Chris King explained, We approached the situation with uncertainty. We were advised to ask open-ended questions and simply listen to his narrative. Perhaps he could provide new insights or details. Ultimately, Barry King found the account Gunnels shared plausible, yet it conflicted with his previous statements to others. One consistent detail was his denial of any awareness or involvement in the Oakland County child killings. Gunnels stated, At this moment I am completely unaware of the actions that man may have taken against others. Chris King, in reference to his unsuccessful polygraph tests, remarked, It's perplexing to me. How can you explain attempting to deceive during one polygraph test and then failing a second one? If you had no involvement or knowledge of the crimes, why resort to cheating in the first place and then subsequently failing the second test? It simply does not make sense. Gunnels expressed to the Kings his deep regret, saying, I feel dreadful. I cannot fathom the thought of such events occurring without my awareness all those years. It truly troubles me. Coming up on Weird Darkness In 1864, Canton, Ohio, a romance between German immigrant Ferdinand Hoffman and local girl Caroline Yost spiraled into a tale of deception, abuse, and ultimate tragedy. Their ill-fated union, marred by Hoffman's criminal past and violent tendencies, culminated in a shocking church stabbing and a dramatic manhunt. But first, the Sabretooth Clan a group of modern-day vampires who blend seamlessly into society by day but embrace their nocturnal alter-egos by night. With custom fangs, vintage attire, and a unique philosophy, these lifestylers host extravagant balls, perform rituals, and even have their own spiritual pantheon, all while maintaining a strict no-blood-drinking policy. What is it like to live as a vampire? That story is up next. Ever had that eerie feeling of being watched? There's no one there, at least nobody you can see anyway, but still you can feel those ghostly eyes upon you, the watchers in the shadows waiting for their moment to scare you, haunt you, or something even worse. That is the theme for these carefully selected creepy true stories of the paranormal designed to have you wondering if you too are being watched from the shadows. This all-new collection includes stories about the Hat Man, Black-Eyed Kids, Shadow People, Poltergeists, UFOs, the premonitions of a dying man, forest demons, and much more, all absolutely true, all chosen by the master of the paranormal himself, G. Michael Vasey. Watched from the Shadows – Scary True Stories of the Paranormal 
Available now on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks. There exists a group of individuals who identify as vampires, not solely for the sake of trendy pop culture. These contemporary vampires possess fangs, attire themselves in vintage clothing, and uphold what they consider to be vampire philosophies. The primary enclave of these vampires lies within the Sabretooth clan, situated in Los Angeles. This group comprises like-minded members, each wearing custom fangs crafted by their founder, Father Sebastian. Members of the Sabretooth clan integrate into society, with some selectively displaying their vampire identity at events, while others are more overt. The lifestyle of the Sabretooth clan may not appeal to everyone, but for those intrigued, they are open to welcoming new members. Some of these modern vampires do engage in blood consumption, which they obtain from black swans, individuals who admire vampire culture but do not consider themselves vampires. However, the Sabretooth clan abstains from the blood-drinking practices embraced by certain vampire factions. Instead, members prefer to don custom fangs, wear colored contacts, attire from different eras, and adopt the persona of Children of the Night. By day, Sabretooth clan members blend seamlessly into society, holding regular jobs, raising families, and leading generally conventional lives. The clan believes in a group of spirits that watch over them. One of these spirits, Fred Samiti, the host, serves as the emblem of the clan's endless night vampire ball and bears a resemblance to the voodoo spirit Baron Samadhi. Members of the clan present gifts to Fred Samadhi as offerings during the ball. Described by the group's founder, Father Sebastian, Kitra, the witch, is recognized as the sorceress and vampire witch, characterized as both forceful and emotionally intense. Elorath, the dragon, can be invoked in rituals for power, while Mradu, the knight, is viewed as a protector. According to Father Sebastian, individuals belonging to the Sabretooth clan identify as vampires or lifestylers. This contemporary vampire lifestyle allows flexibility in adhering to their chosen way of life, enabling them to decide when and where to embody vampiric traits. Most modern vampires fall under the lifestyle category, steering clear of role-playing games and instead follow a vampire philosophy rooted in traditional vampiric elements, excluding blood drinking. As per the Sabretooth clan forums, the current is considered the spirit and blood of the clan. It stems from a collective energy formed by members' interactions, personal achievements, rituals, and events. The current gains strength through new initiates completing the rites of transformation, drawing and sharing their excitement and passion to enhance the spiritual energy of the collective. To be considered for an official invitation to join the clan, prospective members must undergo the rites of transformation. This process includes the creation of custom fangs by Father Sebastian for the applicant, followed by the recitation of specific promises in a southern accent, such as, I'll not sleep with my fangs on by the power of Sebastian. Subsequently, the second rite involves looking at oneself in a mirror with the fangs in place, followed by the naming and the Ankh ceremonies. After these rituals, select individuals may receive invitations to join the clan. Father Sebastian's fascination with vampires began at a young age. As reported by The Cut, he initially requested a set of fangs from his orthodontist grandfather, a request that was denied. In 1994, Sebastian started crafting his own fangs, which are prosthetics attached to the wearer's teeth with adhesive. Members of the Sabretooth clan, Sebastian's personal clientele, undergo a 30-45 to 45 minute in-person appointment for custom-made fangs priced between $150 and $299. Sebastian claims to have created thousands of sets of fangs since the commencement of his practice. The Sabretooth Vampire Clan, much akin to Taika Waititi's vampires in What We Do in the Shadows, hosts an annual vampire ball on Halloween, 
known as the Endless Night Vampire Ball. Celebrated for the past two decades in various locations, the ball enforces a strict dress code inspired by a different historical period each year. Described as a fusion between a Venetian masquerade ball and a vampire court, infused with the vivacity of a rock concert and the sophistication of a burlesque cabaret, the ball promises a unique experience. Upon induction into the Sabretooth clan, members gain access to certain exclusive privileges, including attendance at the Conclave Festival held in different castles worldwide over five days. Exclusive to Sabretooth clan members, the festival offers a range of activities, such as seminars, musical performances, vampire and fetish balls, as well as interactive games with other clan members. In 2017, the festival was hosted at Castle Finstergrun in Austria. To maintain formal communication on official clan message boards and during events like the Endless Night Ball, vampires steer clear of using human names. Instead, they adopt sobriquets, personal and descriptive pseudonyms chosen by or bestowed upon clan members. With guidelines in place to prevent excessively flamboyant or overtly pop culture-inspired names, members are encouraged to draw upon ancient languages or deities for naming inspiration, while being cautioned about the potential potency such names may hold. When given or selecting a vampire name, it is expected that a clan member be addressed by that name in all interactions with fellow members. Referring to them by their mundane, human name is considered extremely impolite, disrespectful, and an infringement of their privacy. Ferdinand Hoffman, a German immigrant, arrived in Canton, Ohio in 1864, where he crossed paths with Caroline Yost. Despite her parents' disapproval due to lack of trust in Hoffman's background, Caroline grew closer to Ferdinand following their courtship, and the couple ultimately eloped. The suspicions held by the Yost family towards Hoffman's character were validated when his previous history as an unprincipled vagabond involved in criminal activities such as counterfeiting and horse theft came to light. Caroline personally experienced his abusive behavior and criminal tendencies, leading to his arrest from theft from her father. Sentenced to prison but released early after joining a Union regiment, he deserted shortly after. Subsequently arrested for counterfeiting again in 1866, Hoffman received a year-long prison sentence. Caroline decided she had endured enough, obtained a divorce, and legally reclaimed her maiden name. Upon his release in October 1867, Hoffman sought out Caroline in Canton. After evading him for some time, she encountered him in the German Reformed Church on Sunday, October 13th. Fleeing from his demands for her return, Caroline found herself cornered by Hoffman, who insisted on her compliance. Out of fear, she reluctantly agreed to his demand for a kiss. Hoffman embraced her, then produced a bowie knife and proceeded to stab her in the chest and abdomen. Caroline shrieked and collapsed to the ground as Hoffman relentlessly inflicted a total of 18 wounds. The church echoed with the woman's screams and men's shouts as Hoffman hastily departed, his hands still stained with his victim's blood. Upon exiting the church, a group of men gave chase to Hoffman as he made a dash toward the railway tracks. They apprehended him just in time, poised for a possible lynching until influential individuals intervened, escorting Hoffman to confinement. The tip of Hoffman's knife had fractured upon initial impact with bone, diminishing the severity of subsequent stabbings compared to if the blade had remained intact. Caroline was transported to her father's residence for medical attention, though her condition remained grave. Law enforcement awaited her recovery status prior to pressing charges against Hoffman. Unrepentant in his jail cell, Hoffman expressed only regret for not ending his ex-wife's life immediately. Caroline fought for nearly a week, maintaining consciousness until her passing on the ensuing Saturday. Hoffman faced formal charges of murder. The subsequent day, the jailer discovered Hoffman lifeless in his cell, having fashioned a noose from a bedsheet to end his own life. His body was left hanging as the jail doors were opened to the public drawing a steady stream of visitors to witness the demise of the perpetrator.
When Weird Darkness returns, from fiery pits to Satan's domain, our modern conception of hell is a tapestry woven from centuries of art, literature, and religious interpretation. But how much of what we believe about the underworld actually aligns with biblical teachings? We'll look at some common misconceptions about hell and discover how our cultural understanding of eternal damnation often diverges from scriptural truths. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. From the intricate paintings of Hieronymus Bosch to the exaggerated portrayals in films like Constantine, hell has been illustrated in numerous diverse manners. However, its most prevalent components – hellfire, souls enduring torment, and macabre demons – are often misinterpreted. Analogous to the evolution of beliefs about angels, the contemporary depiction of hell is the culmination of centuries of artistic interpretations, religious doctrines, and creative inventiveness. The ancient Greeks espoused a retributive afterlife known as Tartarus, which served as a significant source for Christian artists and writers as they crafted their multifaceted mythological depictions. Other contributing influences encompass the Sumerian underworld known as Kur, characterized by its vast, desolate cavern, along with the Jewish notion of Sheol, a dark realm analogous to Hell. Over more recent epochs, few Christian figures have left a more enduring imprint on the perceived landscape of hell than Dante Alighieri, his Inferno, and John Milton, Paradise Lost, with numerous visual artists, Bosch notably among them, also endeavoring to capture its essence. Nevertheless, as Western artists and worshippers have constructed a cultural interpretation of hell, the fiery afterlife portrayed increasingly diverges from the biblical depiction of hell. There is a widely held belief that individuals in hell are currently undergoing punishment. Some Christians subscribe to the notion that upon death individuals are promptly judged by God and placed in either heaven or hell. Young Christian individuals often express concern about the fate of those who have passed away, hoping that they have not been consigned to the lake of fire. However, it's important to note that God does not execute judgment immediately. Instead, judgment is reserved until the final day. As outlined in the Bible, no one is currently in hell. Every person who has ever lived, regardless of their conduct, is awaiting the return of Christ and the ultimate day of reckoning. That being said, once you die, you can't change your mind about how you lived your life or who you put your faith and trust in. A prevalent belief is that one's actions determine their destination in hell. The contention over the significance of good deeds versus God's grace has been a long-standing debate in Christian history. The doctrine of good works posits that individuals must engage in virtuous actions to gain access to heaven, while the doctrine of grace, as depicted in the Bible, emphasizes that our placement is determined by whether we acknowledge Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 states, "...for it is by grace you have been saved through faith." This is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. 
The following item does not revolve around a misconception of hell, but rather a theological disagreement regarding its nature. The question at hand, is hell everlasting? While many adherents of Christianity are acquainted with the notion of everlasting torment, there exists a substantial group of theologians who advocate for annihilationism. Annihilationism posits that, after a period of suffering, its duration unknown, God eradicates the consciousness of those beyond redemption. Proponents for annihilation cite passages like Isaiah 5 verse 24 to bolster their stance, where it stated, Therefore, as tongues of fire lick up straw and as dry grass sinks down in the flames, so their roots will decay and their flowers blow away like dust, for they have rejected the law of the Lord Almighty and spurned the word of the Holy One of Israel. Conversely, supporters of the belief in eternal hell draw on numerous scriptural references. The scriptures depicting the punishment of the unrighteous in hell as eternal fire, Matthew 25, 41, unquenchable fire, Matthew 3, 12, shame and everlasting contempt, Daniel 12, 2, a realm where the fire is not quenched, Mark 9, verses 44 through 49, everlasting destruction, 2 Thessalonians 1, 9, a domain where the smoke of torment rises forever and ever, Revelation 4, verses 10 and 11, and a lake of burning sulfur where the wicked are tormented day and night forever and ever, Revelation 20.10. Despite the unsettling nature of these descriptions, it's understandable why some might lean towards annihilationism. However, this concept is not widely supported by theologians as a biblical truth. Another common misunderstanding about hell is the belief that Satan holds dominion over it. Lucifer, originally known as Ha-Satan, simply translates to the adversary. In the Bible itself, Satan's authority and origins are ambiguously defined. It is not until much later, notably through Dante and Milton, that the portrayal of Satan as a formidable winged demon emerged, often referred to as the King of Hell. According to the Bible and mainstream post-biblical theology, hell is recognized as Satan's confinement, not his realm. Similar to his reign over heaven, God governs hell. Nonetheless, reconciling this notion with events such as Satan tempting Jesus during his 40-day ordeal in the wilderness appears challenging. If Satan were indeed imprisoned in hell, how could he undertake such actions? Moreover, instances in Genesis hint at God permitting Satan to challenge the faith of humans, notably illustrated also in the book of Job. It's a common belief that the perception of hell as a prominent theme in the Bible is a misunderstanding, as it is purportedly not even referenced in the Old Testament. While contemporary churches place significant importance on the concept of hell, one might anticipate a comparable emphasis in the scriptures. Nevertheless, some individuals claim that the Old Testament does not contain any allusions to hell. This absence of mention could be attributed in part to the fact that the Bible was not originally composed in the English language, leading to potential discrepancies in terminology. Furthermore, the interpretation of the Old Testament can vary depending on the particular translation being used. In the King James Bible, the Hebrew term Sheol is interpreted as hell 31 times, as the grave 31 times, and as the pit three times. Present-day translations of the Bible often translate Sheol as the grave, the pit, or death, all connoting a consistent concept, an eternal place of retribution. It is worth noting that Jesus focused considerably more on discussing heaven than hell, with references to heaven outnumbering mentions of hell by a significant margin in the New Testament. This disparity suggests a recommendation to prioritize reflections on the rewards and everlasting life attainable in heaven over concerns about hell. Additionally, abiding by the teachings of Jesus Christ, the main focus on the New Testament alleviates apprehensions regarding hell, further influencing the emphasis placed on this aspect. Blame Dante for perpetuating the misconception of varying levels of punishment in hell for different sins. Contrary to popular belief influenced by Dante's writings, the Bible does not mention distinct circles or zones in hell or different degrees of punishment based on sins. Instead, the Bible portrays all the damned collectively as sinners and unbelievers who will be cast into the lake of fire. While some religious beliefs suggest fitting punishment to the sin, 
These ideas are man-made constructs and do not align with biblical truths. Dante likely drew inspiration from Greek and Roman mythologies, such as the eternal suffering of Tantalus and Tartarus for taking ambrosia from the gods. Tantalus endured perpetual hunger and thirst, with water receding when he tried to drink, and fruit forever out of reach from a nearby tree. Some individuals hold the belief that purgatory serves as an alternative to hell. According to the doctrine of purgatory, there exists an intermediary realm in the afterlife, resembling hell, where one's sins are cleansed or purged to ready the individual for heaven. While certain aspects of biblical teachings may be subject to interpretation, the existence of purgatory is not among them. The Bible provides no substantiating evidence for the concept. Initially proposed by the early theologian Clement of Alexandria, it was Pope Gregory the Great in the 5th century who officially incorporated purgatory into church doctrine. Despite being embraced by several denominations, belief in purgatory remains a theological doctrine rather than a scriptural one. God desires to see all of us in heaven, yet some believe that God finds pleasure in the suffering of the wicked in hell. The Bible portrays various facets of God. At times, He exhibits wrath, while at other times He embodies a compassionate Father, overflowing with mercy, grace, and love toward His children. So which should we embrace? In truth, both are valid. The God depicted in the Old Testament is the same God revealed in the New Testament. The distinction lies in the absence of a Christ figure, a Messiah in the Old Testament, to bear the burden of sin in our place. Hence, mercy and grace were not as readily accessible as we as sinners were perceived. In the New Testament, we encounter Jesus the Christ, who shoulders our punishment, causing our guilt to be eradicated even from God's sight, purifying our spirits. Those who reject Jesus may face hell, yet there is substantial evidence that God takes no delight in this fate. He loathes condemning sinners and eagerly anticipates their return to His embrace. Reflect on Ezekiel 18, where it's declared, But if a wicked person turns away from all the sins they have committed, and keeps all my decrees, and does what is just and right, that person will surely live. Do I take any pleasure in the death of the wicked? proclaims the Sovereign Lord. Rather am I not pleased when they turn from their ways and live. Another common misunderstanding is that the majority of individuals will attain heaven, while only the most evil will end up in hell. Matthew 7.13 appears to address this notion. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Alternatively, the Message translation offers a perspective. Don't look for shortcuts to God. The market is flooded with surefire, easygoing formulas for a successful life that can be practiced in your spare time. Don't fall for that stuff, even though crowds of people do. The way to life, to God, is vigorous and requires total attention. Universalism a doctrine that has gained popularity in modern times but has ancient Christian origins, proposes that all individuals will eventually be saved by God after a period of punishment, regardless of their faith or deeds. Despite its appeal, universalism lacks theological support. While the Bible does not extensively discuss hell, it explicitly indicates that hell exists for occupancy by not only Lucifer and his demons but also by non-believers. Some find it concerning that morally upright individuals who are not followers of Christ may face eternal damnation, regardless of their virtuous actions. This belief stems from the understanding that no one is inherently good enough to deserve heaven. Thus, salvation is only attainable through Jesus Christ, the sinless advocate for humanity. Many people hold the belief that hell is a large realm of continuous agony, no reputable theologian contends that hell offers any form of pleasantness. Despite this notion, there exists individuals who challenge the concept that hell solely entails an immense physical suffering where individuals are burning and writhing in excruciating pain. Regardless of their stance on physical torment, the majority of Christian scholars posit that the true anguish of hell does not stem from fire, brimstone, physical mutilation, being consumed by worms or any other harrowing imagery that may come to mind. Instead, 
Hell is fundamentally defined as eternal separation from God. The consequence of this detachment is a spiritual anguish far surpassing the physical tortures commonly associated with hell. It's believed that all descriptions of physical torment and suffering are merely attempts to elucidate the spiritual agony one would face. As it's impossible to comprehend without experience, God inspired individuals to portray it in a manner accessible for our understanding. Additionally, there is a prevalent misconception among some individuals, especially those who express a preference for going to hell to party with friends rather than to heaven, a cursory examination of scriptures readily disproves this fallacy. Yet various media portrayals depict hell as an unending, debauched celebration, blending elements of societal vices with genuine damnation. Contrary to such depictions, the biblical representation of hell is dismal and devoid of any party-like attitudes. While the Bible provides limited descriptions of hell, it unequivocally conveys it as a place of unquenchable fire where desire remains unfulfilled. Moreover, it's a realm of full consciousness and recollection, intensifying the pain experienced. Even the demons are depicted as enduring suffering in this realm. If the narrative I just shared has caused you some distress, and you're uncertain about your destination in the afterlife, I have provided a page on my website to assist you in discerning the answer. You can go to WeirdDarkness.com slash Eternal Darkness. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Eternal Darkness. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others, as well as help for other issues such as domestic abuse, sex trafficking, crisis pregnancy, and more. Even help if you're struggling to get past a paranormal event that happened to you. That's the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. While there, you can also click on Tell Your Story to share your own true paranormal or creepy tale. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. John 12, verse 46. I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. And a final thought. They say time heals all wounds, but that's only true if the wound is clean. If it's dirty, the wound becomes septic and ravages the person. The same can be said for our soul. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises. But those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your close-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human. Bigfoot
Bigfoot loves our country and you, so much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does, so he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past – absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts.